Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, especially um, within the conversation, and challenged uh, to talk about some of the work that I've been a part of in Haiti. Oh, show, showing all the slides here. Um, <laughs> but let me, I um, wanted to start a little bit at the beginning here um, and talk about a, a couple of things. I want to talk about a different conception of health and well-being, certainly a, a, a risk that we can all con take in uh, creating connection with other human beings to follow up with peacemaking uh, and to risk the actual uh, deep compassion and caring and then, of course, uh, talk a little bit about ways to move forward. But let me start uh, with this. On, uh, at at 4.53 uh, p.m. on January 12, 2010, I was working in this clinic. I was seeing patients in an HIV clinic. I had a student with me, and we had some really great plans for the near future. We were hoping to do community work, the kind of stuff I had learned in Haiti. We were hoping to do that in uh, rural Alabama. I didn't know at the time that the next place I would be working a few days later was in Port-au-Prince at the main uh, uh, public facility, the main public teaching hospital in Port-au-Prince. But at the time of the disaster, at the time of the earthquake, just a few miles away in, in the Caribbean, I was in Alabama seeing HIV patients working with skills that I had picked up in Haiti, much more than my education uh, in, other, in other places. And inside this abandoned strip mall, inside this really wonderful clinic, it was really easy to be lost to the outside world. I was caring for someone. I had a student with me. We were thinking about community work. We were thinking about pushing ahead on the kind of potential that's very real in Alabama, that's very real on this path between Montgomery and Selma. I got to go to Selma a couple times a month to take care of patients, to provide care. And in that was often on this road reflecting on the march that happened in 1965, on the civil rights movement, on the energy and the sacrifice and the risk that people took to create a better um, place for people in terms of civil rights, in terms of the right to vote. Uh, Forty-five years earlier in Selma, um, a lot of things came together and pushed forward to a place where the right to vote became even closer to reality. It certainly didn't solve the problem, but, but there it was. And I was taking that trip as a physician, as an advocate, as an, as an activist, a word that I really proudly take, uh, to try and create a better, a better condition for the few people that I got to touch, and if we could build something bigger, all for the better. The trouble is, the same conditions that existed in Selma in the early part of the 20th century, in the 40s and 50s, leading up to the 60s, those same conditions were still making people sick, were still making people oppressed, were still ruining human potential, robbing people of rights. We had turned a corner on civil and political rights. People could vote. People were less likely to be caught up cursorily and put into jail for unnecessary reasons, but people were still getting sick unnecessarily. Lives were shortened. People were at risk. And, and in the world of HIV, people were still very isolated, very afraid of a treatable illness, of an illness that had solutions. But here we were um, working to address that. And I was very happy after about a decade uh, of work in Haiti to be on this new chapter, uh, working in Alabama, trying to push forward on some of the things that I had learned in that setting. And really applying what I've been taught, which is the discipline of social medicine, this um, pretty simple but I think really meaningful idea that illness comes from social conditions, economy, poverty, uh, gender, other, other forms of, of pressure. And if we, if we look at this you know, kind of very basic framework about things that make people sick, um, all but a few of these are more socially inflected than they are biologically inflected, physically inflected. Medical school focuses really on this other side, you know, on germs, on genetics, on, on the physical environment we live in, on uh, aging. But the things that make us sick are everything on this little slide. And the only ones that aren't heavily inflected by society, by human relationships, by economy, by um, the, the, the ways we interact as people, are genetics and aging, really. And you can take away aging because, frankly, poor people don't get to live as long. Their lives are less, less fulfilled. People get sick and, and die sooner. So I think all of these can be socially um, 
can, are, are socially constructed. So then the job of a physician, the job of anyone caring about human health, about uh, trying to make the world more livable and make lives uh, somewhat, somewhat easier and better, is to try to break down those structures, to try to break down the social pressures that are making people sick. And one term that's been applied to this for some years is called structural violence. And I just wanted to put it in the slide to say it and defend it a little bit. It sounds dramatic to some, and, and the idea of, of the violent structures that we live in um, to us in privilege can sound dramatic, but I've not yet met a poor person. I've not met a person living in, uh, on, on, the, on the tough side of inequality that doesn't agree that the barriers that keep them from education, from gender equity, from, uh, from religious freedom, from uh, freedom of sexual preference, uh, those structures are violent and they have very serious consequences. And if the consequence is ill health, if the consequence is earlier death, then uh, I think it's fair to, to call them uh, violence. I got to Haiti through my uh, young years in Philadelphia. I went to Temple University. I wanted to be a musician. I, I, I um, really didn't care much about politics. I wasn't thinking about medicine. I didn't have a grand plan to, uh, to get to a place now where I really am able to work on health rights and, and what's now called global health. But I started out as a musician, something that still helps me get through day to day. And one of the things that I, I did was I rode my bike to Temple University every day and realized pretty quickly that the curriculum was more on that road than it was uh, in the classroom. I loved the classroom. Um, but I, I learned more on those bicycle rides through some very tough neighborhoods, some very poor neighborhoods where people were right on the edge. Uh, and, and it's fairly analogous to the trip I've made hundreds of times now to Haiti, analogous to the trip from Selma to Montgomery through these poor places where that reality is a lot stronger than what I was learning in pre-medical courses or even what I was learning trying to uh, be a part of and enjoy the arts and, and take in what can be, what can be learned and, and sustained through, through art. Music took me to Haiti. A friend invited me to teach there in 1996. I thought I'd spend six weeks, and then it turned to a year, and then a year and a half, and now 15 years later. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for that, for that introduction. I'll get on in a minute to talk about uh, what's going on in Haiti now, to talk about the disaster a little bit. But I wanted to put this challenge out really on the theme of risk and on the theme of this invitation. To me, one of the riskiest pieces of this work is to develop and to keep coming back to and not to run from compassion. Not sympathy, not empathy, not charity, not good works, not stuff that I do because it makes me feel better, but really compassion at the root like this definition. To suffer with someone, to, to, to go along in a struggle so deeply and so completely that it becomes your own. And I think that's one of the only ways we're going to innovate, we're going to move forward, we're going to create the kind of social change that would undo the social structures that are making, ma making people sick. But there is a risk for that. And for those of us who are lucky to be in school, who are lucky to have professions, who are lucky to uh, come from privilege, to put your lot with someone who is less likely to succeed, to put your work into something that will fail from time to time, or even much of the time, is painful. It invites a certain kind of uh, hurt, a certain kind of ache into, uh, in, into, in, into one's life that is risky. Of course, uh, work in a place like Haiti, uh, work in a place like Mozambique, <coughs> even if it's coming into peace, uh, is risky physically. Um, I, would, I would hope that none of these are, are like the triangle of, of death in Iraq or some of the other risks that people put themselves at physically for the work. In Haiti, there's been a coup since I've been there. There's been this disaster. There's been flooding. Of course, those things have some small risk. There's illness and, and some exposure to illness that, that's, um, that comes with the work. But it honestly is nothing like what my colleagues and friends live to every day, like the risk that they go forward through. I've been sick from this work. It's just inevitable. But I get to come and rest. I have doctors and tests that can be done to help support my, my body and get me back into the field. So I, I, I would just propose to this conversation that real compassion, deep compassion, is in fact a great risk. It's a risk worth taking uh, and inviting the uncertainty that will come, come with that. Um, I put this quote up because it's one that 
keeps recurring to me, and as I was coming to thoughts about this talk, I, I came to it again. It's not that this is all downside. It's not that I'm only sadder because I'm in touch with suffering. It's not that I'm only in a, a more serious and, and more kind of dour uh, place because I happen to work with poor communities and work on health and work for people who aren't going to necessarily be well. There is also real happiness that can come from this. Certainly, I feel better about my work and my role, sacrifices aside. Certainly, there's the chance anytime I meet someone in, in the clinic, anytime I meet someone in organizing and, and trying to put something together, there's always the chance that we'll become happier too and that we can move on through the work um, in, in that spirit. And I, I think before leaving this idea, the other message for students, especially young, young students, before we become experts, become, before we become authority of any kind, and, and in, in, in the process of fighting that, as, as uh, uh, Ms. McIntosh uh, 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 told us, we, we also need to risk not knowing what's going to come next. When I signed up for medicine, I didn't know what was going to come. When I went to Haiti, I didn't really know what was going to come. I wanted to do service. I wanted to be in the world. I didn't want to be in a practice room trying to get good at the piano because I just wasn't going to. Um, but I didn't know what was going to come next. When I was sitting in the clinic in Alabama on the 12th of January, I did not know that I would be in Haiti four days later. I didn't know how serious the earthquake was until I was on the way home and I got a text message from a dear friend of mine who had responded to earthquakes in Pakistan, who had responded to the tsunami in the Pacific, and she texted me from the UK. And Shaista said, this is a serious earthquake. Uh, the, place you, the place you love is in trouble. And over those next 24, 48 hours, it just became clear that I, I needed to show up and work in a place that had been home to me for a long time and that had, had been uh, I important to me and also had gone through this just tremendous cataclysm. Um, the earthquake, the earthquake uh, in, an, in an instant killed something like 250, 300,000 people. It leveled uh, half of the city of Port-au-Prince. It changed the history of this island in the few seconds that it was shaking. It's a, it's a, it's a, a human uh, disaster. It's not a natural disaster. Um, it, it, the earth shook, but buildings fell. Infrastructure that wasn't there failed. Uh, hospitals that should have stood fell. And the suffering is really created by the social condition of that, of that place. Um, this is the, the cathedral and the school where I, where I worked, where I first went to Haiti. Um, it was laid to ruins in, in those instances. Um, and so I went, along with many others, mostly Haitians who responded, but certainly people from all over the world, to try and put back together what little we could in these, uh, in these conditions. This was the main general hospital, our working conditions, very difficult and very primitive. Certainly I was not in any, I wasn't prepared in any way for this. Um, I've been a chronic disease doctor. I've been a community organizer, a community health worker. And uh, this kind of disaster is something I didn't want to see. I hope I don't see again, but certainly was uh, OK to show up because it, I, I needed to show up uh, to, to do the work. And of course, there's risk in that, too. I, 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 have PTS, I have some PTSD at this point from the trauma of that. Over the years, I wasn't going to talk about it, but people have been very personal in these talks. I, over the years, I've suffered from depression, and I think no small part of that has been the, the static of traveling back and forth between worlds, of getting on a plane in Boston and arriving the same day in Port-au-Prince, and trying to make sense of a world that's larger, trying to make sense of the kind of compassion and openness, willingness that it will take to live in the world, to try to make it a better place, hasn't been simple for me. And I, I have not figured out how to do it, so don't ask. But um, we'll, do it, we'll do it together. And I think the, the growing movement around global health and around um, working toward health equity, working toward justice in these means, really has some momentum. I learned from a student today that there's a minor in global health here on the campus. I know one of the, one of the really most exciting undergraduate groups called Globe Med concerned with global health is here on the campus. And students are now planning and growing toward careers doing this kind of work when the, uh, the term global health really hadn't coalesced when I was coming up uh, through pre-medical studies and through, through my medical school. And I think one of the bottom lines beyond this recognition that social pressures create illness, that social medicine, an approach that takes these things into account, is one way forward and a way that I think is really not just um, not just uh, Im important, but necessary. All the medicines and all the vaccines and all the technology in the world won't solve these problems. 
HIV is a solvable problem. Malaria, which kills a million children a year, is a solvable problem. Um, it just hasn't been implemented in places that are suffering still from in inequality. So we need to work on ways to move forward. And, and with that, I wanted to end uh, on, on really where I feel like our best hope is. Uh, certainly the work that we're doing in Haiti and, and even the work that I've been doing personally, my own small contributions have been in this same mode. And we're, we're starting to call it um, accompaniment. We're starting to call this work accompanying the process of getting better, whether it's patient by patient or whether it's by building a health system, whether it's by educating a next generation of nurses and doctors and pharmacists. The, the, the kind of motion that we need to make is fairly analogous to the civil rights movement where we need to create conditions, create social change that's going to allow better health, that'll allow people not to get sick. And, and simply to deliver on, uh, simply to deliver on what, what's, e what's already possible. It's not a Luddite point of view. It's not an anti-technology point of view. I'm a physician. I use the tools of Western medicine and I use them happily to do what they're good at, fight infections, uh, control blood pressure, treat cancer, um, uh, uh, cure surgical disease. But these need to be, these need to be uh, implemented, especially in places where, where they haven't been, uh, where they haven't reached before. And they need to be done until the person who's on the tough end of that equation says that we're done. So it's not my opinion about what's first. It's not m my expertise about what, what would happen around a public health program, but simply to be with a problem, to understand where people are, to participate in a dialogue that allows us to make common cause, to create solidarity from compassion, from this really profound and, and potentially profound and radical change in oneself, to give over of yourself, to step back and not be the expert, to be unsure about where we'll go together, to create programs and, and, and to create a community around these issues that have got to be solved that are uh, collaborative and, and uh, can be worked through together. Certainly that's where stability is going to come from. It's where innovation is going to come from. And um, it'll also let us know when we get there because the people that we're walking with, the people we accompany, as it says in this quote, they'll be the judge of whether we've arrived or not. And so just to end with uh, this small but important uh, piece, in, in all of this work, global health, public health, health equity, um, social justice, health and human rights, one of, the, one of the biggest missing pieces is just what we see here. It's human, human potential, uh, accompaniment, taking medicines to someone's house each day to make sure they get it, to make sure that someone sees them, to break isolation, to, to bring a little bit of hope into the household, visiting people when they're sick, visiting people when they're well, but you know, doing, doing this work together. Again, it's not an, it's not an anti-technical point of view, it's not a Luddite point of view, but simply something that works, something, that, uh, something that, that is right at our doorstep, we just need to build it. I'm proud to say in Haiti we have 5,000 employees, half of them are community health workers like this that go out each and every day to take care of their neighbors, each and every day to see that their neighbors are doing okay. So when the floods come, they do all right. When the earthquake came, we did lose a lot of people, but this system persisted, not because of the largesse of international aid agencies, not because of the technology of uh, technology and the speed of uh, uh, crisis intervention, but because of groundwork like this. It creates a new possibility, one that, one that may not have existed uh, just in the same way. As the world gets smaller to all of us, especially if we go out into it, invite the common cause that's there, as painful as it may be, another world becomes possible. And I, I do think, especially around health, that this way going forward is part of what's going to create it. Thank you.